Hi, and welcome to module four of lecture 12. This is the midpoint of this lecture and the endpoint of our discussion of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, having discussed their general usage and also how to calc compute both eigenvalues and eigenvectors too. We're now gonna finish this up by discussing a couple more uses of eigenvalues and eigenvectors. The first use we're gonna discuss is related to um, matrix decomposition and principal component analysis. We'll do the first one first. So matrix decomposition is a pretty broad term. It's a pretty broad area. And the idea of matrix decomposition is to take some matrix A and decompose it into other matrices that when multiplied together, give you the first matrix back again. There's a lot of different ways you can do that. We'll discuss one here. What we're going to discuss is known as spectral decomposition or eigenvalue, eigenvector decomposition. The idea is if you have a matrix A with all distinct eigenvalues, so none of the eigenvalues are repeated, and there's an extension of this, the Jordan decomposition that deals with repeated eigenvalues. For now, we're going to assume that all the eigenvalues are unique, non-repeated. Then you can write this thing like Q T Q inverse, where Q is a matrix made up of eigenvectors of the matrix A, and D is a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues on the diagonal. So if you have a two by two, for instance, then the diagonal would be the two different eigenvalues, and the, um, not Q inverse, Q would be a matrix consisting of column vectors placed side by side, the first column vector corresponding to the first eigenvalue, the second column vector corresponds to the second eigenvalue. The eigenvector corresponds to the second eigenvalue, and so on. There's Q. Um, if you do this, you can actually go about and decompose your matrix A into three matrices, one of which is diagonal, the other two which are which consist of um, eigenvectors, columns of eigenvectors. Okay, why would you want to do this? There's a couple reasons. Um, the first is it helps you do things like take powers more easily. So for instance, um, if you want to power a to the z, well, you could write this out a whole lot. Here's the first one. Here's the second one. Here's the third one, and so on. Now note that each of these in here is actually just q inverse times q. Um, which is just going to be the identity matrix. So this ends up being Q, D, I, um, D, I, so on. Um, this is for three, but this goes, on for, this goes on for a while. This is going to be equal to D, Q, D to the Z, and Q inverse. So we can actually make use of this to define powers more easily instead of having to go through and multiply A by A by A Z times, which can be a real pain, we can just multiply, we can find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors and multiply by D Z times. That's easier because if D is a matrix of eigenvalues only, then the Zth power is obtained by just taking the Zth power of each of the diagonal elements. If you want to check that, you can check it at home, um, but it does work out. When you take a diagonal matrix to a power, it's just the power, the same power of all diagonal elements. So it makes this more convenient, and you can also find, define other more interesting z's beyond just, um, you can use this to define more complicated z's, like say one half, right? What's the square root of a matrix? Well, one way of defining it nicely is by using this, because you can't actually take the square root of um, the eigenvalues. So it's convenient to do it this way. So um, this helps you in this way. This other way this helps you is, the determinants, the determinant of A, with the determinant of Q, D, Q inverse, which equals determinant of Q times the determinant of D, Q inverse, which is going to equal the determinant of Q times the determinant of D times the determinant of Q inverse, according to the stuff we did in the previous lecture, um, two lectures ago. And, um, the determinant of Q inverse is one over the determinant of Q, if you call from a previous one. Um, so that's going to equal the determinant of D, 
Why is that convenient? Well, the determinant of D is diagonal. So if D is diagonal, the determinant of a diagonal matrix is, this, is the product of its diagonal elements. That gives us the product of all the individual eigenvalues. So if the matrix has um, non-repeated eigenvalues, then the determinant of the matrix is just a product of the eigenvalues. Again, saving us some time potentially. So here's one use of this um, particular decomposition to help us take um, pro uh, powers of matrices, including things like square roots, and also to take determinants more easily. This is not the most common use of this, um, though this is in political science, sort of sciences more generally, that, um, that goes, that, the most common use of that involves principal component analysis, which we'll get to one second. Principal component analysis is used um, most commonly when you have a matrix A that's symmetric and positive definite, sorry, positive semi-definite. Now, uh, not always, now, so if you, call, if you don't remember what those particular definitions mean, go back to your previous lectures and check those out again. Symmetric means you can flip it, right? You can flip it around the um, diagonal and they get the same matrix back again, positive semi-definite. Um, generally means a quadratic form gives you a positive value, but again, um, you'll see this more later. Point is, go back to the previous lectures if you're not sure what these mean. The important point for us here is if you have a symmetric positive definite matrix, then a couple of nice properties hold. One, you get um, eigenvectors that are orthogonal to each other. So it produces a bunch of orthogonal eigenvectors that obviously have no overlap because they're orthogonal, right? perpendicular. That's good. Um, it gives you clear ways of interpreting each one that are separate from each other. Two, the eigenvalues will be real and also um, non-negative. So you get non-negative real numbers. And this is great because one commonly observed um, matrix A that is symmetric and positive semi-definite is the covariance or the correlation matrix. Um, the covariance matrix right, deals with the covariance of all your, 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 your variables. And it is symmetric positive definite matrix, which means it has nice properties in terms of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We can use those properties to do something called principal component analysis, closely related to factor analysis. And the idea is that the eigenvectors of the matrix, of the co covariance matrix, form the components, the principal components of your system. And the eigenvalues correspond to each component tell you how much of the overall variance or covariance that particular component explains. The higher the the highest eigenvalues explain um, correspond to components that explain more of your variance. So they're more important components in trying to understand the idea. The idea here is that you have some latent space, right? Some latent idea that you um, that is underlying the various variances you observe. And you want to get at that you want to get those latent, the latent dimensions that are important to explaining your overall vari pattern of variation. Well, you can principal component analysis gets at that by splitting effectively this, this space into different components along some dimensions, find the components with the highest variances, and assigning those interpretations that correspond to some real-world thing. So you can see which of the components, the latent components, explain more of the variance in your system. So a common use of this, which is related to this, but not just like this, but has the same conceptual background, is um, when you do, for instance, um, scores to try to score legislators um, and legislatures to try to figure out um, where they fall in some dimensional space, some policy space. So oftentimes you, you, you hear that you know using roll call data votes, so how they voted on various bills, you can observe that um, you can bore down to get the latent space and observe that they're really often thought of as two spaces. One's often called an economic dimension. So positions on economic behavior, I mean, positions on economic policies and a, ver a sort of a second dimension on social dimension, social policies. That's changed over time and also changes in different countries. But the point is that you can break down this overall system of data it produces variance to, under, to try to get at underlying policy preferences that drive the observed behavior. And if you find the ones with the highest um, explained variance, the ones with the highest eigenvalues, these are the components that are most important to your system, to its variance, this variation, and those components correspond to the eigenvectors 
that correspond to the larger eigenvalues. So that's it. Um, so that's one way to look at this. And again, this is way too fast to really get at what this means, but the core concept is that if you're trying to understand sort of a characteristic latent space for this system as seen in its variation and variance and covariance matrix, you can use eigenvalues and eigenvectors to apply to do this principal component analysis to get at this latent space in some fashion. Or you can just use it to multiply matrices together faster and take powers and determinants and stuff. So these are all very useful in, in this sort of way, and you'll see much more stuff on principal component analysis in your various statistics classes. Okay. That's that. Um, now we're going to move on to talking about the second major topic in this um, module, which is centrality measures of networks. So networks um, are, well, they're just representations of edges connecting people and nodes, which are people. These edges, these nodes are connected by edges, um, and you can, you can represent the entire thing by what's called an adjacency matrix, A, adjacency. Yeah, okay, sorry. Sometimes when you look at words on the screen, you just don't seem to make sense. Anyway, adjacency matrix A. The simplest kind of matrix A that just tells you who is connected to whom. So for instance, if you have three people, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. Um, the, the diagonals are interesting, so we'll just do that. And do that. This would mean person one and person three are connected. This is a symmetric one in this case. Um, person one and person three are connected, and person two is connected to no one. So this is a particular kind of adjacency matrix. It, rep it tells you exactly who's connected to whom. A one means connected, a zero means not connected in the network. You can do weighted versions of these things in more complicated examples, but this is a simple, uh, relatively simple adjacency matrix for three people. Okay. And oftentimes, um, it's becoming sort of more well known in, in this in the social sciences in general. And this is really general across social sciences that individuals' um, pattern of connectivity affects their behavior in a pretty complicated fashion. Analyzing these things involves involve networks. Um, one potential interesting property of networks that has, that has been looked at in various contexts is centrality. Network centrality tells you sort of how central an individual is in the network, how important that individual is. There are lots of ways of measuring it, really lots and lots of ways of measuring this thing. The simplest way just might mean number of connections. So in this example put up here so far, um, person one and person three have two have one connection, person two has zero, so person one and three are sort of more important. The degree of connections an individual has is known as the degree. <laughs> Um, so sort of average network degree, so network degree for each individual is a measure of importance for that individual. Um, so that's one possible centrality measure. But it doesn't tell you for more complicated networks sort of how important are the people you're connected to. So one person might be connected to 10 people, all of whom are connected to no one else. And a second person might be connected to two people, but those two people are wildly important and connected to 100 people each. Who is more important? The person with 10 sort of, you know, loner people connected to them, um, or the person who is connected to two people only, but those two people are, are just incredibly important, like, you know, know everyone in the universe. Oftentimes we think a second person is more, is more important in the network because that person has more um, ability to connect to people in two steps, right? The first person can, 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 sorry, can connect to, to 10 people in one step, but no one knew in two steps. The second person can connect to only two people in one step, Step from there can connect to maybe a hundred people. This is actually what you see a lot in, in, in measures of like page rank, like Google page rank on the internet, when you're trying to understand what's an important website. Well, it's not just what the website is connected to by itself, but what sites the website is connected to, but what sites are connected to the websites to which you're connected to, right? So if you have website A, it's not just how many sites B are you connected to, but rather how many sites, this is BI, so each, one, each B is one, but how many sites um, each BI is connected to. So it's really a two-step issue here. Um, how important are the sites to which you're connected? Turns out that one way of getting at this actually uses the exact same methodology of eigenvalues and eigenvectors in that if you're trying to figure out 
how many people, the people you're connected to are connected to. Um, if this is your adjacency matrix, A, and this is a vector corresponding to your, what's called the, your eigenvector centrality measures, then then this equation corresponds, allows you to solve for your eigenvector centrality measures, all of which must, must be computed at once because who you're connected to, right, who they're connected to depends on who the other people are connected to. It's a big interdependent inter inter um, network. So um, you can compute, if you calculate the eigenvalues of your matrix, if you choose, it turns out the largest eigenvalue is the one that matters here, the you choose the largest eigenvalue of your matrix, then the eigenvector corresponding to the largest eigenvalue of your matrix will be your eigenvector centrality measure um, for all individuals in that network. And again, so this presents you with a nice way of assessing um, individual importance in the network that takes into account not only who they're connected to, but also who the people they're connected to are connected to themselves. So it's a two-step process. That's it. Um, so I covered a couple of major topics that you use eigenvalues and eigenvectors um, for. And um, and let me just stop one second there because I was pretty fast. So if I'm person A, here are my three connections. And let's say they're all connected to more people too. This is a person with reasonable importance, not just because they're connected to three people, these Bs, but also because they're connected to um, nine more Cs in addition. Whereas this person might be connected to five Bs, but if the whole chain ends there, they may be thought of as less important. So there, there's a picture view of that. Okay. Anyway, that's it. Um, that covers a couple of uh, frequently seen topics involving eigenvectors and eigenvalues. To finish off the next three modules, we're going to go back through the same basic structure, looking at a matrix applying to a vector and producing a, another vector back again, but instead we're going to consider these things as um, stochastic processes. Um, thank you very much.